Thank you to the SOAS Shan drummers. Um, a, a warm welcome, literally, I suppose, a warm welcome to all of you, and many thanks for making your way to SOAS on a summer evening. Um, I'm reminded, nonetheless, by this week's record heats, we've all been suffering, that a warm welcome in Theravada lands is literally a cool welcome. In Khmer, one says, the jum, to qualify what I would call in English, in the English language, warm hospitality. So let me correct myself with a felicitous dual reference to our Theravadan topic and to our London locale to wish you all a very cool welcome tonight. Before introducing our speaker, I wanted to say a few words about the context in which we find ourselves together. Here at SOAS, we owe very deep thanks to the astoundingly generous and innovative Alpha Wood Foundation, which has enabled the establishment of the Southeast Asian Acad Art, Southeast Asian Art Academic Program. We call it SAP around here. It supports a broad range of activities from student bursaries to research, to public-facing outreach work, all focusing on the Hindu and Buddhist art of Southeast Asia. And with a very broad mission, an ambitious mission, I should say, to make a transformative contribution to the development of human research and pedagogical resource in the Southeast Asian region itself. It's been my pleasure to join the SOAS SAP this year, and in this context, to have had the opportunity to work with Kate Crosby over there, at King's College to support a series of Theravada research events in London this week. So tonight is the crowning event of a first series of workshops held at King's. After the talk this evening, you are all cordially invited to attend a reception in the SOAS Senior Common Room, just one floor up in this building. And tomorrow is a full day devoted to research on the emergence of Theravada in Cambodia from a number of Southeast Asian perspectives. So tomorrow is, is, a, is the last event in this week's Theravada in London series and will be held at the William Goodenough House on Mecklenburg Square. And we hope to have many of you with us again tomorrow. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce you all to Juliana Schober. She is the co-founder and co-director with Stephen Collins, ici présent, up here. Uh, of the Theravada Civilizations Project, about which she will be speaking this evening. Juliana Schober is Professor of Religious Studies at Arizona State University, where she is also Director of the Center for Asian Research. She is a multivalent anthropologist focusing on Burmese Buddhism. Her most recent book is entitled Modern Buddhist Conjuncture in Myanmar, Cultural Narratives, Colonial Legacies, and Civil Society. Yuliana's talk this evening, as you can see on the screen, is entitled, How Can the Study of Theravada Buddhism Define a Subject? So please join me in welcoming Yuliana Chopra. Thank you all. It's a real pleasure to be here today. And uh, thank you in particular to um, Ashley Thompson and to Kate Crosby for the wonderful welcome that we've enjoyed this week here in London. Um, it's been great to have all these conversations with you, and I appreciate all of the different inputs that we have uh, had from all of you who've attended the, past, uh, the events over the past few days. And I'm delighted to talk to you today about the Theravada Civilizations Project uh, and sketch out to you uh, some of what we've been doing. So, um, just to, to um, clarify uh, that I'm indeed talking about other people's work and about a large project in progress. So, I am not actually providing answers to uh, how to uh, define the study of Theravada, but I hope to be able to raise questions about different approaches today and uh, look forward to your comments and um, conversations. In particular, and just to be more concrete, um, the talk will wind up uh, referring specifically to, um, if you, oh yeah, uh, see those tiny little things here? Uh, indeed, they're bats. Uh, they're bats in a cave in uh, Yunkin Hill outside of Mandalay. And as we've learned at the Abidama Conference and because of uh, uh, Hijaz's uh, paper, 
they're not just bats, but they're also disciples of Sariputra who have just listened to the Patana. So um, just staying with the concrete, um, hopefully we'll get back there by the end of this conversation. But let me begin by saying that uh, in 2009, a group of initially 12 and then 21 scholars have been engaged in discussions about Theravada Buddhism as the civilizational force across South and Southeast Asia. Our initial purpose was to delineate the parameters of comparisons of modern Theravada Buddhism. But in the course of that, we also came to rethink scholarly approaches in the field of Theravada studies and its subject, Theravada practices, both of which are rapidly changing. Our project came to engage several trajectories, including on the one hand, a collaboration of scholars drawn from different disciplines in the humanities and social sciences, including history, anthropology, uh, art history, the study of Pali and vernacular literatures, and on the other, searching for new ways to explain local and cultural diversity in the Theravada repertoire to borrow a term from Justin McDaniel. Um, let me see if I, oh yeah. A lousy map of the Theravada world, but please bear with me. All right, so the Theravada project facilitates then a, an interdisciplinary collaboration of scholars that is multilingual, multi-sited, and comparative in its scope. It is the kind of project that can only be undertaken by a group of scholars because its sum is greater than the individual contributions. Initially, the project was organized by Steve Collins and myself, uh, and then we were able to gain the support of the Henry Luce Foundation. Our meetings were supported also then by many institutions, including the University of Toronto, Pennsylvania, Chicago, Arizona State, the École Française d'Extrême Orient, and now also SOAS and King's College here in London. And we are very grateful for the reception and hospitality and conversations we've received during the course of the six-year project thus far. Okay. In addition to our conferences, uh, which mostly consist of conversations we have, uh, we also are preparing for publication several edited volumes, and we've been hosting annual dissertation workshops. Uh, we've developed a website, as you'll see in a while. And uh, Steve Collins and I published a short preview of our collaborative project in the Journal of Contemporary Buddhism a year or two ago. So, um, the study of Theravada Buddhism then encompasses at its core a literary tradition in Pali that Stephen Collins has termed the Pali Imaginaire. It has inspired particular forms of civilizations, hegemonic kingdoms, religious institutions and practices for more than a millennia. Indeed, Benedict Anderson singled out Pali as the one language that exemplifies translocal imagining of regional communities before the advent of print capitalism and modern nation states. Pali Buddhist texts and inscription, inscriptions have also shaped the development of vernacular literature, art, local practices in what we now call the modern nations of mainland Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka. And here, in particular, I want to refer you to the work of Professor, Professor Ashley Thompson and, uh, concerning the emergence of early Buddhism in Cambodia. And uh, the conference that she has mentioned uh, will be taking place tomorrow. We are looking forward to that with great enthusiasm. Um, Theravada Buddhism is practiced now by more than 150 million people around the world, from Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, and Southwestern China, to Vietnam, Indonesia, Nepal, including Dalits in India, and throughout the diaspora networks of Europe, North America, and Australia. 
They contribute to a discourse through which Theravada practices continue to be imagined among Buddhist communities and take on local and modern articulations in rapidly changing contexts of globalization and digitization. The goal of our project then was not uh, to compile a dictionary of Theravada Buddhism or to map its local articulations. Nor did we seek out to reify some vision of a pure Theravada world. Indeed, we wanted to describe the diverse practices of different places and times and show what they might have in common while asserting from the start that we are dealing with continuities and differences that are inflected by local histories with vernacular languages that together give rise to specific Theravada formations. Our discussions focused on core themes in the Pali imaginaire, such as the conceptions of the Buddhist world, dadana, or history, vamsa. And we compare such Theravadan iterations across different cultural and historical contexts. Indeed, to trace and account for family resemblances can be more vexing and challenging than to acknowledge difference and variation in practice and content. I would say that over the past six years, the group has generated a unique synergy and we've come to understand each other's work in more compelling ways. Our con collaboration uh, stimulated also lively discussions about academic differences and inspired work uh, by individual participants, or at least I'd like to think that some of that is true, uh, many of whom have been extraordinarily productive in their publications. And I'm thinking here, for example, of uh, Kate Crosby's recent books on Theravada and on its traditional uh, forms of meditation. I'm thinking about Christoph Emery's forthcoming book on Theravada rituals among Navari girls. And I'm thinking about John Holt's forthcoming book on Buddhism and violence, as well as Jay Carbine's uh, translation of the Kalyani inscriptions and other works in progress. And I also think that our collaborative work has opened up new perspectives on particular research questions. As we broked disciplinary boundaries and pushed thematic comparisons across regions, cultures, histories, and media, our conversations also interrogated received scholarship on Theravada traditions. And here, Charlie Hallisey has made particularly valuable contributions to that discussion, as you all know. That, in fact, preceded the initiation of the project, but nonetheless continued to contribute to it. Because thematic research is inherently interdisciplinary, comparative, and multi-sided, our collaborations changed how we constructed Theravada studies and how we framed our inquiries. Looking back, it seems that we started the project with greater certainty about what constitutes Theravada than some, and perhaps even most of us, would assert today. But then, we were so much older then. Um, as you know, I'm an anthropologist of uh, religion, and I work on Buddhist practices in Myanmar. And if you will permit me that I enter into how to locate the project from a vantage point that is familiar to me uh, from my perspective. And in particular, um, I wanted to focus for a moment on an earlier development that generated new approaches in the study of Theravada Buddhism. Um, in particular, a point that was, um, a point in time that was uh, notable because of the publication of World Conqueror and World Renouncer by Stanley Tambaya. At least for me, Tsumbaya's analysis drew on both Buddhist texts, Thai 
ethnography and history, reflecting his collaboration with Frank Reynolds during their time at the University of Chicago, arguing that cosmological structures described in practice and literature uh, also gave rise to galactic polities throughout Southeast Asia. This study was seen as an early um, beginning of, uh, if you want, a conceptual imaginaire uh, and its contextual historical and sources and sources in practice in context. And since then, major intellectual shifts have taken place in Theravada studies. Today, scholars routinely draw on both textual and contextual sources and on cultural history and genealogies of knowledge. Studies in the history of religion make use of ethnography and vice versa, anthropological work on Buddhism incorporates the literature and of the Pali imaginaire. Let me briefly summar summarize then where I think um, the intellect or where I think the field was at 30 years ago and what kinds of intellectual shifts have taken place since the publication of World Conqueror and World Renouncer. And admittedly, this is rather um, uh, rough in its outlines, but nonetheless, I think it's worth noting just for the moment to give us an opportunity to locate a collaborative project on the study of Theravada Buddhism. All right, so then firstly, a few, if any, scholars today would argue that Theravada Buddhism is merely a philosophy. That wasn't always the case. And instead, I think most of us would recognize that this tradition involves practices and a religious discourse. And this intellectual shift locates authority and authenticity within the community of practice, practitioners and withholds judgments about theological questions. I think that is very important to our approach to how to study Theravada today. And in particular, uh, the work of Anne Blackburn and also uh, of Tom Borchert have contributed to these questions in recent publications. Most scholars would accept also that orthodox doctrines of the elders reflect historically and contextually constructed discourse, as well as the authorship of powerful actors and the agency of hegemonic institutions. We focus in our discussions on how these debates are authorized individually, locally, and socially, that is to say, in terms of a dynamic that goes beyond the individual. This kind of intellectual shift opened up new insights into connections between Buddhism and politics. And in particular, Catherine Bowie's work um, is something that relates here. Um, and uh, this particular turn towards um, the examining the relationships between religion and politics or Buddhism and politics and how they intermingle uh, has led us to reevaluate uh, the social function and the social effects of uh, monastic reforms, the authority of monastic lineages and institutions. Finally, it brought into scholarly focus a wide range of lay practices in meditation and in ritual and illuminated their complex interactions with the Sangha. Okay. This, by the way, is the Chinese tooth relic in Yango. Uh, rituals like the veneration of Buddha images, pilgrimages or ordinations are no longer seen as defiling accretions of history, but rather as transformative practices that constitute Theravada truth in history, text, and culture. A fourth element, and one that I think we all still struggle with in many ways because uh, it's not one that's particularly easy to let go of, is an intellectual shift away from essentializing Buddhist notions. 
that we might sometimes call the original words of the Buddha that comes with, and yet we come to it with now with the recognition that the Theravada canon is an evolving tradition constructed by communities to be the pristine teachings of the Buddha. Uh, this recognition intervenes against statements asser uh, asserting that in my village, people do things in a particular way, and that is Buddhist. Um, or in my preferred Buddhist text, in my particular Buddha, the following statement has been made, and so on. Um, those letting go of that kind of essentialism allows us to assess texts and narratives as part of a living imaginaire and it allows us to revisit the roles of monks as gatekeepers of Buddhist teachings. And in this regard, I want to bring to your attention, of course, the work of Stephen Collins and Louis Gabot. If we were to concede, then, that we know indeed very little with a great deal of certainty about early Buddhism, as Steve Collins has proposed at his Toronto um, keynote, then we would also conclude that um, Theravada's understandings of early Buddhism are constructed primarily in mythic terms. And so therefore the focus of our work as a group has been to historicize what Foucault referred to in his 1978 lectures at the Ecole de France as the dispositive, meaning those genealogies and traces of civilization that map out particular and historically embedded inclinations in the normative network of social reality. By tracing genealogies of practice and disciplines in Buddhist lives, we uncovered a new vocabulary. Uh, and it allows us to be cognizant of a range of Theravada articulations across cultures, across histories, and across literary imaginaires. So this is the Ananda Temple in Pagan. Um, what do we mean then by the Pali Imaginaire and how does that relate to the Theravada Civilizations Project? The Pali Imaginaire embodies literatures and histories that are admittedly much older than the term Theravada itself. We're cognizant of the limitations that underlie the term Theravada as a historical construct with different meanings at different moments in time, and as a discursive field within disciplinary practices that shape sentiments, dispositions, institutions, authority, and hege hegemonies of merit making. Indeed, uh, in another very important volume, Stephen, uh, sorry, uh, Peter Skilling, Todd Pereira, and Jake Carbine, as well as others, asked, how Theravada is Theravada, in order to historicize the term Theravada as a construction of late modernity. Okay. However, Pat Branke made clear in his recent work that the notion of Theravada was used to refer to a particular world prior to the advent of British colonialism in Burma. Important conceptual questions about how to, find, how to define the subject of Theravada studies emerge, therefore, from our conversations. Indeed, questions are, how do we theorize links between practice, text, and history? Other questions that came to the fore are, how can we move from the universal to the local and vice versa? How can we move from individual narratives to larger social and salient formations that shape the lives of communities and civilizations? How do we avoid the dangers of extrapolating too much information from particular narratives and over-interpret in this manner? 
And what can be compared across Theravada civilizations and how can we describe those phenomena as they are refracted in individual lives? Questions like these underscore the need for interdisciplinary collaboration. And I think that's really what is novel and new and different about our project. And it also underscored the need to find new methods to extract information from our material. I don't mean to suggest that we, we resolved all of those questions, far be it from that. But there's a great deal to be gained by asking them. And as we worked to re redefine the subject of our study, Theravada, across national, linguistic, ethnic, and social boundaries, we also wanted to make explicit how themes in the Pali imaginary came to be articulated locally. As our initial perspectives changed, new concerns emerged about translation, about readings of texts and contexts, about shifts in language between Pali and vernacular languages, and about the construction of meaning and its social relevance at any particular moment in time. And we worked to develop a new kind of meta-language that would capture shared premises of this collaborative workshop, or of this collaborative project, by rethinking how and what we study. And so we're looking forward to the publication of edited volumes uh, that will bring some of these issues to the fore. Um, some of those contributions of essays will be think single authored and some of them will be uh, jointly authored, but I think you will find that they constitute or are reflective of a larger collaborative project. Um, so, what then are the themes in the study of Theravada civilizations? With that in mind of what I've just all laid out, can we go back to work? I would argue yes we can, but in a different way. And so for the remainder of my talk, I want to outline some examples of uh, what that new uh, vocabulary entails and uh, how we might proceed with that. OK, I think I'm a little ahead of my pictures, but that's all right. Um, for the purposes of the project, uh, civilization denotes not an essentialized classic model of refinement, but rather a generative open-ended polyimaginaire involving discourses, practices, disciplines, sensibilities to construct meaningful reality across multi-ethnic, social, and historical geographies. As we trace these genealogies of knowledge through time and space, we came to historicize the dispositive of those traces and technologies that form an enduring formation and form enduring institutions. As Talal Assad reminds us, religious ideas and practices are inseparable from the social context within which they emerge. Religion, after all, is a product of the human imagination. By the same token, Buddhist discourses and practices draw upon a repertoire in the Pali imaginaire about cultural narratives told in emic terms like bhavana, nibbana, datu, kudo, kutala, dana, samsar, sangha, and so on. And they create cultural meaning in particular social formations and hegemonies. From this premise, we began to develop new insights into how, for example, hagiographical genres about the Buddha continue to shape the lives of Theravada Buddhists today. Narratives about the Buddha's lives, about the Jatakas, and about apocryphal versions link individual lives to that larger universe. And by the same token, they also connect the periphery to the center uh, 
and to previously uncivilized places. Theravadans seek to discipline the self through techniques like meditation and ritual ordination to establish membership in an ascetic community of the Sangha. Such practices train individuals to transcend, as Steve Collins has put it recently, uh, to transcend, I hope I'm not misquoting, <laughs> um, to transcend self-interest and embrace an ideal um, of personhood that is defined as a non-self. They are conveyed, for instance, in the social habitus of monks, in the physical and mental training they undergo, in the careful folding of their monastic robes, in the measured movements with which they trans, trans uh, with, with which they trans um, walk across their space, um, and um, also uh, by the ways in which they rehearse chanting of memorized texts. Here we are. Those are Shuijin monks reciting uh, their evening meditation. Okay. And we can also see it in the protocols of veneration, um, shown two sources of merit like monastic elders, relics, and Buddha images. In other words, disciplines of the self embody the Theravada tradition and evoke the Pali imaginaire. These practices sustain a particularly privileged status of ascetics and their technologies in complex social systems, civilizations. That again has been a point that Steve has made in his recent work on asceticism. The attainment of Nibbana therefore constitutes an authoritative social status that is central to that particular civilization and epistemology. Uh, this is a Burmese painted pair bike. I believe the original is in the British Museum depicting uh, the enlightenment of the Buddha, or the, the moment just prior to, as he's being attacked by our Mara's armies. And um, I wanted to use this image as a segue into talking about visual representations of the Buddha, but also in the case of this particular image, I wanted to draw to your attention that um, Mara, of course, is understood as the embodiment of evil and the threat to the dispensation that the Buddha overcomes at this particular moment. And so this episode uh, depicting the assault of Mara can also be used um, as a justification for the defense of Buddhism, which in recent uh, events we have seen both in Myanmar as well in Sri Lanka and elsewhere. Um, so this scene can thus also be read as a defense of samsara and the ultimate victory of the teachings over its detractors. Defending the Dhamma can be interpreted as a noble action indicating highest spiritual attainment. So, but really, I wanted to use it as an entree to talk about images and about um, Buddhist relics. And note that uh, Buddhist material and visual objects, like images and relics, are representations of enlightenment that figure importantly in the creation of communities. This is my daughter, by the way. <laughs> um, and this is in Mandalay, uh, Buddha pointing to the site that was to become uh, the place where um, Mindong built the last Gombang Palace. All right. So Peter Pels has argued that Icons are objects with agency and mediate social realities. Buddhist objects are informed by aesthetic styles of the Pali imaginaire and yet also express local histories. In Becoming the Buddha, Don Swero shows us how Buddhist images become embodied in the presence of the Buddha through ritual settings. The mediation of 
narrative through material form and aesthetic style in painting, film, digital, and virtual media, thus constitutes a kind of a damascape. And I use that word in reference to Charles Hershkin's notion of a soundscape in the study of uh, Islamic preachings uh, on video, on um, cassettes in Egypt. And I think that it has been very usefully used uh, or, uh, or employed that notion in the study of the anthropology of religion uh, recently. So I wanted to bring it into this particular project. Artistic styles of Buddha images are usually named after dynasties to indicate not historical chronology, but instead the powerful patrons of the fields of merit uh, constituted through the, or, uh, through the consecration of the image. For example, the Mahamuni image, and here's a close-up of it. Um, as you can see, uh, it's, it's laden with gold and jewels. Um, and every once in a while, um, it's also slimmed down. And most recently, I think that was done by Thiba, um, uh, perhaps to generate some income. But um, in any case, the Mahamuni uh, image continues to figure importantly in its current location in Mandalay. And it presents a particular kind of reading of the history and place fashioned by centuries of Arakanese Burmese narratives about subjugation and hegemony. Its presence in Mandalay today, here you can see how indeed the image has been distorted by the many offerings of gold leaf it has received. Um, its, image in pres its presence in Mandalay today continues to transform the lives of many pilgrims who offer food and wash the image's face uh, each day at dawn. The comic results of these transformative narrative uh, and rituals are mediated not only by the original icon shown here, but equally importantly by countless copies of the Mahamuni image that mediate Theravada sentiments and dispositions and replicate fields of merit across time and space. Merit gained from ritual practice, like the face washing, becomes manifest not only through future rewards, but is also constructed, but also constructs the social fabric of social and political relationships, particularly in traditional settings. Giving dana and giving oneself through ordination are central tropes in this um, reality, the reality of the sasana. And in Burma, as elsewhere in the Theravada world, Buddhist practices, particularly those involving merit-making rituals, have long been inseparable from politics. Traditionally, kings were expected to be patrons of Buddhist institutions, and their power was understood as a reflection of their moral practice. Theravada social formations produced classic Buddhist kingdoms ensuring the longevity and profound influence of the Theravada tradition, creating a thatana, creating a Buddhist world. Royal and local chronicles often um, describe those hegemonic fields of, marriage, of merit and their patrons and affirm their charisma, authenticity, and authority. Such history gives voice to epistemologies of the Pali imaginaire in order to create specifically Theravadan worldviews. And here I want to mention the work of Jacques Leiter, Pat Branke, and uh, Steve Berquist, all of whom who have, have contributed to in, uh, investigating these aspects in their publications. 
Through this discourse, Theravadans construct an understanding of the sasana that profoundly shapes the world that they inhabit, socially, intellectually, and culturally, where the Buddha is present and venerated, and where, as Bob Hefner would say, the really real constitutes semiotic ideologies. This Theravada understanding of time and place creates a particular historical consciousness expressed in chronicles and in other geneolo genealogies of the dispensation. Okay. Okay. This is a view of the top of Shridagang. Uh, it's a photograph on exhibit, at least when I was there, at the museum at uh, Shridagang in Yangong. And I thought it was interesting because it showed the very tip of the pagoda against the skyline of what was at least an imagined modern city. So I want to turn our attention then to questions of modernity and Buddhism. Most Theravadins experienced modernity as part of a secular power and as part of colonization introduced by European powers and here I want to refer you to the work of Anne Blackburn, who has written about that with regard to uh, changes and continuities in Sinhala Buddhism. It, modernity profoundly affected traditional life ways predicated on a holistic Theravada dhatana and its social relationships. New Theravada formations emerged in response to competing secular knowledge, political power, and social practices. And Tom Borchert has written about that with regard to a contemporary Thailand as well. Monks and kings in Thailand, Burma, Cambodia, and elsewhere in the Theravada world enacted far-reaching institutional changes and reforms and formulated modern ethics as Anne Hansen has shown in her book, How to Behave. How can the Vinaya remain relevant in modern contexts? In the early 20th century Burma and Sri Lanka, transgressions of monastic discipline formed the plot of provocative novels that depicted monastic individuals as narrative subjects and expressed their profound disenchantment with the modern colonial period. And so here's a moment where monks uh, who elsewhere in the Theravada tradition have been almost anonymous authors and progressively more known authors, but here they actually become subjects of modern narratives and, and the focus of the subject is their disenchantment with traditional Buddhist practice. I think that's a quite remarkable moment of modernity. And I think uh, at least at one point, one of Charlie's students was thinking about doing a dissertation on this, but I'm not sure if that's still so. So um, in his recent work on Weza, Buddhist wizards uh, who practice meditation in some form of self-ordination oftentimes, uh, Pat Branke has indeed documented alternate responses to rationalizing reforms, dadana beauty, and other popularization of Buddhism through lay meditation and other practices. In Branke's work, but also in Kate Crosby's new book on the suppression of traditional meditation, uh, we find that successful Buddhist reforms silence, disempower, and marginalize those who alleged use of magic is said to, to subvert righteous fields of merit. Those who elude reforms initiated by the center often retreat to the forest. This move is not merely an attempt to elude coercion from the center. Departing for the forest is also a common trope for the quest for enlightenment, as stories about such charismatic individuals recall salient episodes in the life of the Buddha. And I want to introduce you to one of those places that is a way. The perspective is a little difficult to capture, but it is also difficult to photograph. This is indeed Yunkin Hill, where you find a staircase going down into a grotto. 
And it is in that grotto that I took the picture that is on the poster for today's talk. Um, so, uh, Yunkin Hill is a, way, a, way, a place away from the center. It's away from the Mandalay City and former court. It's a place where people took refuge at the end of World War II. And as its name indicates, it is a place that is supposed to provide protection. Okay. So, um, it also houses a number of small forest monasteries and meditation cells. Okay. And um, it houses many, several powerful icons, as you can see here. Um, and it is also home to Burmese Wazas and a number uh, of smaller hidden caves that seem to be dedicated more to personal practices. So you find this larger public space, but also very hidden caves within that hill region outside of Mandalay, Yankin Hill. And you also find occasional pilgrims that visit the Crado on top of the mountain um, and uh, deep inside it. Other responses to modern transformations compromise cha comprise changes in modern education curricula, in the rise of lay authority through meditation, and in changes of, in gender roles, uh, in the roles of women in Buddhist orders. And here I want to refer you again to the work of Nancy Eberhard and also Christoph Emmerich, both of whom have worked on gender and Buddhist practice. Uh, and another aspect of modern response in Buddhist practices uh, concerns the commodification of some modern Buddhist practices. And here you see a shop uh, in the Mandalay market where monks can buy ropes and things of that sort. Okay, we know that the rise of inside meditation, vipassana, has not just been an innovation for lay practice, but also has become an epitome of modern Buddhism and cosmopolitanism. Its widely popular and varied forms of practice have been disembedded from the cultural context of their production and appropriated by other religious and secular communities. Diverse forms of Buddhist modernism and contemporary Theravada now extend to a global multi-ethnic and multi-sided diaspora. Digitized modes of the communication and virtual realities that shape emergent Theravada formations. And I want to conclude my uh, uh, traversing of the Theravada world by focusing for a moment on others, uh, Theravada Buddhism and others, to note that monolithic representation, like I've just engaged you in, of the Theravada Buddhist Sangha and of Buddhist practices in places like Myanmar and Sri Lanka um, have been sort of at the forefront of our study. And they have occupied the attention of uh, they are academic interlocutors, and they have often submerged tensions with surrounding religious and ethnically different communities. Theravada civilizational narratives, their theological histories, and their moral reasoning are not accepted by many religiously and ethnically different groups that inhabit the same geography. We therefore must ask how Theravada civilizations encounter the other, those living right outside the Pali imaginaire. How do Theravadans accommodate other religious epistemologies? In times of prosperity, questions about who belongs to Theravada communities may not be pressing, but in recent crises, Buddhists have advocated a defense of the Dhamma that became manifest as violent attacks on non-Buddhist others. 
Exclusionary formations of identity and belonging have come to characterize a sizable number of Buddhists who, like their non-Buddhist neighbors, have become both victims and perpetrators of communal violence. And here I want to work, refer you to the work of Schachleiter and uh, John Holt, and perhaps also to some of my own writings, as well as the fact that we hope to dedicate some of our future uh, conversations on the Buddhist, Theravada Buddhist encounter with others. Let me conclude then today um, with an image of um, uh, Buddhist relics in Mandalay. You can see here they are encased, although they're hard to make out, and I think that's the purpose of it. Um, in any case, um, here we are at our website, and I invite you all uh, to take a closer look at uh, this particular website that also serves a community that, of scholars that you may join, if you so wish, um, at TheravadaCiv.org. Uh, it's free for anyone who is interested, and it is uh, it serves uh, a professional group that uh, we've started up a year or two ago, and that is now formally associated with the Association for Asian Studies. That means we meet once a year um, in a public meeting uh, in conjunction with the Association for Asian Studies. So next time it would be in March in Seattle uh, when the Association for Asian Studies meets. But we hope that this uh, net website will help facilitate a scholarly network engaged uh, in the study of Theravada and particularly bring in the interests of younger scholars um, who might be interested in becoming involved through conferences or by applying to the annual dissertation workshop, uh, or even just through virtual participation on the website. You can establish a profile. You can list your publications. You can even begin discussions. So, uh, And you can look for new announcements of publications, events, conferences, and the like. All right. So by now, we have uh, a newsletter as well as more than 200 members of the Theravada Studies group around the world. And um, I invite you to join if you are interested. And I'd like to thank you for indulging me in traversing uh, a reimagined kind of study of Theravada Buddhism, one that I don't own, but I have merely tried to represent uh, an effort of a scholarly group that is working collaboratively. And I think that has a great many uh, benefits to it because uh, we can draw on everybody's expertise. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>